Well, good morning, everybody. Well, good to see everybody. It's good. Um, we're here. We are at the end of February. Um, just a couple of things I want to just say before I, the message this morning for the next few minutes. Uh, first of all, um, if you would like to take part in our conversation around our multi-site uh, discussions with Riverview Baptist Church, uh, we are having an open town hall meeting on Sunday, March 11th, the back end of the March break, uh, at 3.30 at our Brentwood campus. So we're having a town hall, and if you'd like to find out more about what's going on and where we're at in those conversations with RBC that we're saying, not the bank, but Riverview Baptist Church, um, we would encourage you to come out on that Sunday afternoon at 3.30, March 11th. We'll, we'll be announcing it again in the days to follow. Um, I just also want to highlight that we do have a big tank of water here, and if you're new with us here today, you may say, what, do people take baths after church? No. Um, we, uh, this is an opportunity for us, according to the Bible teaches us, to express our faith publicly through what we call believer's baptism. When you make a decision to follow Christ, Jesus says, go into all the world and make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we are simply, as a church, giving people opportunity when they decide to open their hearts and lives to Christ that they are now being obedient to Jesus' command of expressing that publicly. Now again, Kevin said this in his prayer, but I just want to put this out to you. We also have what we call spontaneous baptisms, where people just feel uh, led to say, you know what, I need to take that step of faith today. If God's going to speak to you during this service, guess what? We have towels, uh, we have shorts, and we have t-shirts. And Kevin will be there at the end of the service for you to respond if you so choose. We are excited today that we have, I believe, three or four candidates coming uh, to... Um, tell the world that they love Christ. Well, with all that said, um, today we, you know, this is what church is all about. It's about living out what God wants to, to do in this world, sharing God's hope and God's love. And through this series, in the month of February, we've been talking about uh, connect. We've been talking about relationships, um, living out, navigating uh, the deep relationships as God intends. And uh, Micah has been carrying the heavy load on this. I was away in India, and Micah preached, I understood very well, on friendship. And then he even preached on marriage. Micah preached on marriage. I mean, isn't that wonderful? I thought that was a great challenge for him. And, uh, and then last week, Micah preached about um, how do we deal with all the strangers in our life? And we're called biblically to show hospitality to strangers. Now, all those messages are on our TJC Moncton um, uh, YouTube channel, and we encourage you, if you missed one, to follow up and, and listen to one of those. Well, we're today going to talk about another critical circle or area of our life and relationships, because you could kind of say, well, Dave, you talked about friendships, you talked about marriage, you've talked about strangers. I mean, what else is there to talk about in relationships? Well, today, we want to talk about our relationships we have within the church, within God's family. I just want to turn your attention to actually a one key passage in Acts 2.42. If you have your smartphones or you have hardcover Bibles, if you want to turn to that, I encourage you to look at that. It's up here on the screen. And actually, why don't we read this? It's not a long passage, so it shouldn't exhaust us. So here we go. We're going to read this. Here we go. They devoted themselves to the teaching of the apostles, the life together, the common meal, and the prayers. Um. Brent Hudson, our teaching pastor, has said if we were to translate this into our modern church situation, we would read it like this. They devoted themselves to following the Bible, to the life together, to worship in the Lord's Supper, and to prayers. What I want you to do today as you look at that passage is to zero in actually on one key phrase. I want you to read that first uh, three words, they devoted themselves, actually the first four, they devoted themselves to, and then I want you to go to the second critical phrase, the life together. They devoted themselves to the life together. You know, when we talk about relationships, what a way to describe relationships, doing life together. And today I want us to chew on this idea. Um, we need to understand, what does it mean? I mean, here's the Bible telling us that when the early church came together, these were some critical spiritual practices they were doing. 
And of those four critical practices we see, teaching, prayers, you know, worship, breaking bread together, doing the Lord's Supper together, there was this fourth one that was saying, and they did life together. Actually, uh, uh, again, Brent was pointing this out to me, that the actual Greek word of doing life together, you could translate it, they busied themselves by doing life together. It wasn't something they sort of tagged on when they could do it. No, they actually said, this is part of my weekly routine. Let's, how are we going to do life together this week? How are we going to do life together this month? How are we going to do life together this year? And that is a description, not of a f- nuclear family. That's not a description of the running club. That is not a description of the Lions Club. That is a description of the church. They did life together. Now let's just hit pause for a second. I just want you to take a moment and just look around at all these people. Just look around. What goes through your mind when you look at these people? Don't say it out loud. (laughs) When you think about all the sorts of people who show up for a service, people who may be very similar to you or may be very dissimilar to you, how do you think about relating to them? What do you think about doing life together with people in the church? You know, a famous author that is one of my most favorite authors and Christian thinkers of the past century, the 20th century, was C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis was a giant of a mind. He was an author. He's written famous stories. He's written famous work. He was a giant of a mind. And he became a Christian later on in his life. He taught at Oxford University. When he was asked about what he thought about going to church and being part of a church family, this is what he wrote in his book, God in the Dock, Essays on Theology and Ethics. He says this, when I first became a Christian, I thought I could do it on my own. Are you, are you there? I thought I could do it on my own. By retiring to my room and reading my theology. But then he further discovered, he went on to say, but how, ex- how it is extraordinary, how inconvenient to your family it becomes for you when you decide finally to get up early and go to church. It doesn't matter much to your family if you get up early for anything else. But if you get up early to go to church, it's a very selfish of you, and you upset the whole household. But then C.S. Lewis went on to make this observation. He said, as he started to attend church, he said, I dislike their hymns very much which I consider to be fifth-rate poems set to sixth-rate music. But as I went and as I continued to go, I saw the great merit of it. I came up against different people of quite different outlooks and different education, and then gradually my conceit began peeling off. I realized that the hymns were nevertheless being sung with devotion and benefit by an old saint in elastic side boots, otherwise known in our terminology, rubber boots, in the opposite pew from me. And then I realized that I wasn't fit to clean those boots. Going to church gets you out of your solitary conceit. Hmm. You know, I think about his observation about why we struggle to go to church. Here's my observation, because you're saying, well, Dave, you're talking to all the people who haven't shown up. (laughs) <laughs> I'm here. Come on. Isn't that good? I, I go, yes it, yes, it is. You know, I, I wonder, though, when a lot of us show up to church, we treat it like going to the grocery store. You know, we drive in, we find a parking spot. We might see some people we know. We give them a wave. Hi, how you doing? What are you doing today? Well, I'm going to go get some spiritual fruit today. I need to pick up some grace and mercy and love. Oh, good for you. I'm running a little low myself on the sugar of sweetness and mercy. I'm going to go pick up that. So we we, we treat sometimes going to church, I think, like going to a grocery store. We're all here to get something for our spiritual benefit. And we recognize, of course, others, too, have spiritual needs that need to be fed. And so we're polite. We nod. We smile. And we go on with our spiritual shopping. Actually, isn't it funny that often when you talk to someone new who's showing up to a new community, new city, new area, they'll say, oh, I'm just church shopping, which just belies the fact that it's kind of like we have this transactional relationship. 
we're going to come, we'll get what we need, thank you very much, and goodbye. You know, I want to call relating to church this way, let's make a deal. If you're following your outline, let's look at that. It's called, let's make a deal. It's simply, we treat church like a transactional relationship. We come into the church community with just two questions. Will this church serve me? Because I have needs, emotional needs, spiritual needs. Will it serve my needs? And then the second question in a transactional relationship is always this. Once you find out how it's going to benefit you, right, the next question you always ask is, how much is it going to cost? Right? That's how we work in our culture. You know, those questions make sense, again, in so many relationships that we have in our day-to-day weekly life. I mean, let's say I decide I want to go to a dance class and learn line dancing, you know? Whatever. Okay, I will, I will, I, okay, that was a bad image for you, okay. I, so, <laughs> I've been away too long. If I, if I don't like, but you see, here's the thing, if I go to a line dancing class and pay my fee, and if I don't like the line dance teacher... If I feel offended, or I don't feel I'm being taught fast enough, or not being appreciated for my line dancing efforts, guess what I'll do? I won't pay the fee, I'll say toodly-loo, and off I go to another line dancing class somewhere else. Toodly-loo, anyway. <laughs> now, now he, listen to me. There's nothing wrong with transactional relationships. This is so deep within the culture we live. The profound difficulty is when we try to treat the church in a transactional way. When we treat the church like a spiritual grocery store. Where I think it is primarily about serving me, my needs, and hoping that I get a lot of discounts that won't cost me too much. Today I want to talk to you about the biblical vision of what it means to be in relationship with one another within the church, within God's family, within the body of Christ. L- l- let's talk about this key phrase again that I want you to zero in on from Acts 2.42. They devoted themselves to the life together. The life together. You know, you know we are calling the relationships in church in this message today sacred connections. I'm convinced we'll never really be devoted to the life together until we grasp what makes our connections sacred. Now, I don't have all the time in the world. I I can't take through the entire Bible and the depth of the Bible, but what makes our sacred connections. But when you and I share a common faith in Christ, we have a connection that does not exist in any other type of relationship. We have a sacred connection. And I want to just quickly walk you through some of the reasons biblically why we have a sacred connection. So this is, these are the reasons. This is the teaching right now that's going to help you understand why we need to do the life together. First of all, very simply is this. Jesus Christ is our foundation. In 1 Corinthians 3.11 we read, For no one can lay any foundation other than the one we already have, which is Jesus Christ. You know, there's a holy mystery to the church, this place, not the building, us. There's a holy mystery here. The Bible tells us that in God's people, when we're gathered together as his church, that's, this is where the presence of God dwells. The invisible Christ is the basis of this visible community of people. People who have by faith have opened their hearts to Jesus are now bound together, not by genetic DNA, but by the very blood of Christ. See, because Jesus is the foundation, he defines what it means for us to do our life together. If you try to say, well, I think sometimes, again, what we do is we all have grown up in relationships, especially our family relationships and some friendship relationships, so we have already determined what it means to relate to people. And maybe our experiences were good, maybe our experiences were bad. Truth is, probably they were both good and bad. So guess what we do? We come into church and we have our little relationship rule book that we've already figured out about how to relate to one another. But guess what? We don't get to make the rules about how to relate to one another. Jesus Christ is our foundation of the church, and how Jesus relates to his church, that's how we are to relate to his church. 
you know, as we think about this, that Jesus is our foundation of our community, here are some, here are some implications. The fact that the foundation of Jesus Christ is, is for our church, it moves us from a marred identity that we all have to a new identity. All of us here are new creations. Because we are, um, because we are, the Bible says, once alienated from God, but in Christ and through his work on the cross, we are now reconciled. The Bible says we were once condemned, but we're now, we are now forgiven. Once we are rejected, but now we are accepted. I'm going to make a few India stories here. I can't help it. I've been to India, so I'm going to share a few India stories. But I was at a chapel service with World Vision India, and the woman who opened up the chapel service, she said to everybody who was gathering there that day, she said, I want to welcome all the kings and queens of God's kingdom here today. Welcome, kings and queens. I thought, wow, what a neat way to describe what it means to be a royal priesthood, what it means to be a God's chosen people. You see, if that's the type of people we are, we are new creations, we are children of God, we are kings and queens in his kingdom, that means that as we do life together, we need to treat one another with deep honor, profound honor. There are no ordinary people here if your life is in Christ. You are in God's family. You are part of the forgiven ones. You know, you know, if Jesus is our foundation as well, it helps us not only to have new identities, but also it helps us to see things as they really are. It's through Jesus Christ that we understand the fundamental and ultimate realities. People here look only on the things below. Well, faith in Christ helps us to see things above and beyond and eternal. And therefore, as we do life together, we will seek not simply on the cultural parameters of success. We will rather seek out to live out the things together that really matter. We'll encourage one another to serve, to give, to thirst for justice, to show mercy, to work for peace. You know, if Jesus Christ is our foundation in this community as well, we will start to value All that we say, all that we do, all that we think, and all that we act, and all that we are becoming, we will want to be more like Christ. And therefore, as we do life together, we will worship and love God, we'll love others, we'll love one another with a joy and a humility and a thankfulness. See, that's what happens when we realize that in this community, it's not your rule book on relationships, it's Christ's foundation that sets how we are called to live together. You know, the Bible says that one day every knee will bow before the name of Jesus and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and acknowledge that he is Lord of all. Here's what I want you to know. If you're part of the church, if you're you're in the church, you're already ahead of the curve. You know that Christ is Lord. You know that he's our foundation. And it changes everything about our connection with one another. We together know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. So I want to say today for you who are in Christ, welcome kings, welcome queens to God's kingdom. You know, here's the other reality, though, as we think, as we're devoted to the life together. It has a hard negative implication Our sacred connection in Christ means that the divisions of the world don't count. The divisions of the world don't count. In Galatians 3.28, says there's no longer Jew or Gentile, slave or free, male or female, for you're all one in Christ Jesus. The divisions don't count. Now, I want to just quickly just show you some slides from India. And um, this was in southern India, North Chennai. It's a city, and this, and this is the northern part of the city, Chennai, about 7 million people. World Vision is working there. And we got to see, uh, uh, we went into the place where they had built some uh, houses for the, the working poor. Um, these were fisher people, uh, fishermen and fisherwomen people who were fishing out in the Bay of Bengal. Um, they lost all their fishing huts, by the way, during the tsunami of 2000. And what was it 2004, 2006? Um, but the, the, it came and just wiped everything out and killed hundreds and hundreds of people. So we got to see the work they're doing there around education, health, uh, child protection issues. Um, uh, there's a lot of violence in this area. And, we, and, and a lot of, as you notice there, a lot of sexual abuse as well that they're trying to deal with. 
Now, now here's the thing. As I got to walk around and, and meet all these uh, people in India, I got to walk in, in the slums, and I got to work with, walk with the World Vision people. I became aware of one thing about India. And those of you can... Um, uh, uh, we're, we're going to hang on that picture. You can have to put up my goofy smile. Um, but I became aware again, and you can Google this, of course, is that India has a caste system. And it comes from their Hindu worldview of, the, of Brahma, the, the Hindu god of creation, which basically said that when they created P Indian people, uh, there was people who came from the head, people came from the arms, people came from the thighs, people came from the feet. And there's actually a fifth category. There was also the untouchables, a whole group of people who simply are untouchable. They're, they're not even part of the body. And that caste system has been entrenched for thousands of years in India. Now, again, governmentally, they're trying to deal with it. They're trying to break that, that caste system, but it is deep. Now, here's the amazing thing. I'm simply saying to you that in India, on the other side of the world, there are divisions that have affected people for thousands of years. You don't, you don't have to go to India, though. You know that there's divisions here. There are certain people, certain clubs you're allowed in. If you have certain status, you have a certain name, if you have a certain, you know, skill, we have our own divisions. You go to school, you know there's groups, and you're allowed in this group, you're not allowed in that group. We do it all the time. There's always divisions. I just want to simply declare to you that when you come into the church of God and you're going to relate to one another, there are no divisions. There are no divisions. If you're wealthy, welcome. If you're middle class, welcome. If you're lower class in the sense of you don't have the income that the upper class has, welcome. If you're educated, welcome. If you're not educated, welcome. If you've got an arts degree, welcome. If you've got a civil engineering degree, welcome. If you're 99 years old, Florence, welcome. <laughs> Come on, let's give her a hand again. If you're six months old, welcome. The point is there are no divisions. And we cannot ever allow the divisions of the world to count in the cross, in the community of Christ. I like what Brent Hudson has said here. He goes, the sacred connections God is creating between his children knocks down the world's division and pulls us together rather than pulls us apart. The segregated life may be a reality in our world, but not when we're doing the life together. I mean, just to be honest, we, I was just talking to Micah. He was telling me that there's about 180 people who are taking part of Guess Who's Coming for Dinner. And you know, part of the excitement and stress of this event is all people know, I, I got an address, I, and I hope Micah gave you the right addresses. Can you imagine? Hi, I'm, I'm here for dinner. You, you are? Well... Come on in. <laughs> Honey, we got somebody for dinner. <laughs> well, wouldn't that just be wild? Anyway. <laughs> no, no, Micah has it all in control. Right, Micah? Right. Okay, good. <laughs> so anyway, don't want to put any fear in you. But the point is, the point is, the only reason we're gathering you together, you have Christ as your common foundation. Here's the... Here's the last thing. I, I'll, I'll, let me just finish by, before I move on to my last point. If we're going to do life together, let's open our lives and our homes to all, not letting our status or our stash define us, but rather our sacred connection to, in Christ. Well, that brings us finally to this last understanding about how we relate to one another in the, in, in the, in the church. We are the body. You know, one last implication of our sacred connection is that this is how faith is lived out. Listen to how it's described here. We, he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. This is a description of the church. And as each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and, and full of love. You know, the experience, I want you to understand this. In, the, in, the, in a few minutes, there's going to be people here who are making an individual sole choice to say, I'm opening my life to Christ, and I'm expressing that publicly today. That's an individual choice. No one can do that for you. Your family can't do that for you. Your friends can't do. You have to make that choice to believe. But 
as you make that individual choice, you now get to live your faith not out in a solitaire sort of, I can do this on my own. You need to do it in community. We are not called, and notice here, to be chess pieces. We are called, rather, to be a spiritual body that's knit together. You know, we are the body of Christ. Have you ever noticed something about your body? That it's really important that all your parts are really deeply connected together. I mean deeply connected. Can you imagine if all your arms were just loose and just barely hanging on? You know, they just sort of chose to show up when they wanted to. What would that be like, right? I mean, I think about people when they say, I have a detached retina. They're freaking out, you know? Or they have a detached valve in their heart, you know, issues. That's serious stuff. I, if someone says, you know, I think my hip is getting detached from my body. I mean, that's, that's serious, and yet, you talk to people spiritually, and they say, well, how are, you, how are you with your church? Well, I'm feeling kind of detached. Think about that. This is serious. It's serious for your own soul journey, and it's serious for the body of Christ. It means it isn't healthy and growing. I want to tell you, we all know a healthy body is deeply connected. As the scriptures say here, it fits together perfectly. And if the body parts start to become detached, it is a serious concern. But when everything is healthy and deeply connected, guess what the body can do? We've been watching the Olympics. Those are well-connected bodies. They're healthy. I mean, they're flipping and flying and dancing and jumping. And, you know, they're doing a lot of crazy stuff. I mean, for those of you who watch Virtue and More when they're, they're, you know, big gold medal and ice dancing, I mean, it was incredible what they did. I mean, we got to see a healthy body do something incredible. Guess what? When the church is deeply connected and healthy and every part is doing their part and no parts are feeling detached, guess what happens? Some amazing things happen. I'll tell you what happens people find hope. People can come into a church community and feel loved and get, and get, and get comfort and, and healing. People can start to live out their, their skills and their callings and, and, and live out the new identity they can have in Christ. We get to be a light in the world. We get to make a difference in our community and our society around the world. We get to sponsor children and help save their lives. We get to help speak up for truth and help move people towards the light rather than towards darkness. We get to see transformation, not just transactions. When the body of Christ is fitting together and growing and serving in love. I mean, today we're going to see people getting baptized do you think that's, that's just because of one or two individuals have done some work here? Don't you believe that for a minute? It's because there's a body of Christ here. Everybody has done their part. And because of that, God smiles and he's glorified and heaven rejoices and people find hope in eternal life. You know, I, I want to end on this. Let me ask you this question. When you show up for church, what are you hoping to experience? Have you thought about that? If you're serious about showing up for church, what do you want to experience? I, I tell you what I want to experience when I show up to church. Am I going to experience God? Is God going to speak to me? Is he going to show up in that moment, in my soul? He may be quiet, but will he show up? Now, here's the thing. If you want God to show up in your life, let me tell you some things you need to do. You need to, first of all, listen to what the Bible says, because God speaks through his word. You've got to listen to the teaching. Can I also encourage you, you need to pray. You may say, I don't really know how to pray well. Well, it's just a conversation with God. Say, God, I'm here. There, there. You just prayed, okay? You also need to come to the Lord's table at times and remind yourself that you're broken, you're poor in spirit, and you need God's mercy. It isn't, hey, I'm, I'm really good, God. I've checked off. No. You're only saved by grace. Those are all things you need to do. Now, here's the tough part. You can do that basically without paying attention to anybody else. But guess what the scriptures tell us? There's one fourth thing that you need to do if you're going to experience God in your life when you come together in the church. You got to do the life together. You got to do the life together. 
But I know what some of you are thinking. But I don't want to. I mean, I like my family, sort of. I like some of my friends. I like my buddies at work. I like my buddies at the club. But I really don't like a lot of people at church. Icky. Can I ask that God will do one thing in your life? He'll fill your hearts with Christ-like love. The supreme mark of the life of Jesus Christ within a Christian is love. And here's what Jesus says to all of us. Here's what he says. This is my commandment. Love each other in the same way I've loved you. And that love is the unifying force that will help us as a church to carry out God's purposes in the world. It is love people in our church for one another and for others beyond. That is our one strategy, our one weapon, our one agenda. And that love will peel away our conceit towards others. That love will be tenderhearted and forgiving. That love will lead us to live holy lives, seek God's glory, serve one another, and be a witness for Christ. And that love will make all of our connections here sacred. We will experience God more deeply as we devote ourselves to our common life in Christ. Guess what? That means we have to be present. We need to give and encourage and teach and help. And we will have to practice the grace of Christ. We will have to practice patience and forgiveness. But ultimately, these sacred connections will grow great souls, and we will become the church that God intended. Well, I'm going to invite the worship team up as they come and lead us in a song, and I'm going to hand this over to this moment, that following this, this uh, song, um, the candidates will be coming. Now, here's the thing. While this song is being sung, if God is inviting you to express your faith in Christ, Kevin's going to be over here in the corner um, receiving you, and we have, again, like I said, towels and t-shirts and shorts maybe god's speaking to you today that you need to take this step you know the bible simply says this when we get baptized we're actually declaring two things one we're declaring that we belong to christ and secondly we're declaring that we belong to god's family so i invite you to come i just want to let you know too that as we will be having some people in our church family being baptized We've also invited um, Jarvis Lepper, who does ministry at Harvest House. He has a couple of people in their ministries that they also want to take that step of faith. And we've opened up and said, welcome um, here. So Jarvis is going to also be leading a couple of candidates in baptism as well. And I'll let him lead you through that when he is in that moment. Let's pray. Lord, help us to love one another. We are your church. Amen. Okay, and uh, Kim and Chris, we're going to read something for Sarah. Sarah's favorite verse is, Save those who are weak and needy, Psalm 82.4. And uh, we're just, it's just an exciting moment for us today as parents and uh, to watch uh, Sarah make this uh, public decision. So, uh, will you just join us all in prayer? Lord, thank you for the gift of baptism that Sarah can publicly declare her love for you. Father, we ask for your blessings to be poured out to her. We pray that you will guide her, give her hope, and a vision for her future. We thank you for blessing her with a gentle spirit, a caring heart, and a desire to serve. We ask that you will bless us as her immediate family and us as her church family, that you will give us the wisdom to help guide her in her daily walk with you. Lord, we ask that you will protect Sarah and fill her heart with joy. We pray this will be a day that none of us forget as we witness Sarah's love for you. Amen. Okay, Sarah. Okay, I'm going to get you to put your hands together. And I'm going to ask you three questions, okay? So, Sarah, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. And, Sarah, will you commit to following Jesus with your whole life? Yes. And, Sarah, will you seek to become a person who loves like Jesus? Yes. 
Okay, then on profession of your faith, and in presence of all those gathered here today, I'm going to baptize you in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Big breath. Now this is Maya, and many of you may have not met Maya yet, but Maya, yeah, come right in. Maya is a young adult who uh, I got to know a couple months ago. Maya wandered into one of her Christmas Eve services and wrote on her next step card that she wanted to know what it meant to become a Christian. She came in and uh, into an office with Dave and I, and we talked for a couple hours about what it meant to be a Christian, and she accepted Jesus there. And it was a powerful moment. It was very special. And uh, we're excited to baptize her today. Okay, my, I'm emotional. Wow. Come on over here. Okay, first question. Um, Maya, do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for your sins? Yes. Yes. And Maya, will you be obedient to the Bible and by walking in step with the Holy Spirit? Follow yes. God. Yes. And Maya, will you love those who love God and love those who don't love God? Yes. Yes. Okay, then Maya, upon profession of your faith, in front of everybody gathered here, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Jarvis, and I work at Harvest House Atlantic. I was baptized uh, when I was a teenager in the ocean, and uh, the person that baptized me said we almost had to go to PEI to get enough water. Um, this is good. This is a good level. Um, God's in the business of rewriting stories, and uh, Carrie uh, gave her life to Christ just a few weeks ago. And as part of her journey, this is really interesting, we've been watching Billy Graham videos uh, to help her on her journey. And as you know, Billy Graham uh, just passed away uh, days ago. And so I'm excited to baptize you today, and uh, I have a few questions for you. Um, first of all, have you decided to give your life to Christ? And do you believe that Jesus died on the cross for you? Yes. And do you promise to love him and to love others? Yes. And because of your commitment to Christ, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. excited that uh, people are getting baptized today, that lives are transformed. And Kayla uh, has given her life to Christ, and I've seen her heart, and she loves to sing to Christ, and you can see her joy as she sings, and I'm excited to baptize her today. Have you, do you believe that Jesus died for your sins? Do you promise to love him and to love others? Yes. And because of your faith in Christ, I, I now baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 